is where I took my first few steps aboard the Alabaster. My first time aboard a Philcor ship, actually. I boarded with Pistachio. We exchanged some small talk while we lugged our stuff up on the gangway together. We're both from the firmament, though we didn't know each other from before the mission. It was only after we arrived here and had a proper chance to talk that we realized we'd actually grown up not far from one another. Different schools, though. I love this little seating area down here, but I never felt comfortable sitting here for too long. It's just too exposed for my liking. Anyone can look down at you without you knowing. The acoustics here, too, they, they really carry your voice. I couldn't have Canary catching wind of my misadventures. By the way, what do you think of this window? I was always pretty indifferent to it, but Pistachio, oh, she hated it. Wouldn't like to sit down here at all. The times we did, she would carefully edge around the window to where she wanted to sit. Strangely, a bunch of pistachio stuff would end up down here, right in the middle of the window. But I wouldn't know anything about that. Whoa, this is crazy. I've never been in here before. If Canary found out about the state of this place, she would flip a... Wait, what did he do to the bed? How did he sleep? This man is an enigma. I remember hearing about this creature on Earth, right? A farm animal? I heard they slept standing up. Maybe Aubergine was the same. He did have augmented legs. Come to think about it, I also remember hearing that a common pastime of Earth folk was to tip over these animals while they slept. Oh, suddenly I find myself filled with regret, dreaming of what could have been. Ugh, so empty. Almost clinical. Why is everything lined up like that? Just so you're aware, this is how everyone's bedroom looked before we moved our stuff in. Minus the fish, of course. Canary sure loved her fish. I think maybe she related to them on a personal level, you know? All cold-blooded and scaly, blank, expressionless eyes, her mouth doing that thing where it opens and closes all the time but nothing of any value ever comes out. All right. Huh? Oh, really? Did you have to come in here? It's just such a mess. Sorry. Messy room never really bothered me. I've heard it's a sign of intelligence. But honestly, if that were true, I probably wouldn't be stuck in this damn cockpit. Oh, if only I were trapped in there. I still never finished Pocketbook Wrestlers 3. It's crossed my mind a few times while I've been up here. God knows I've got time to finish it now. Last time I played, I was stuck, but I reckon I now know how to get the paperclip mask from the stationary mountain to unlock the rubber band belt. Hey, maybe when we get out of here, we can play something together. We'll have a lot of time to kill getting back to civilization. I have to warn you though, I'm rather competitive. It is so cozy in here. A vanilla scented candle would not go amiss in here, would it? I used to come here all the time. Marmalade and I, we would come sit in here for hours with the fire on and just chill, you know? I don't know if you've noticed this about me, but I'm kind of talkative. He was the opposite, the anti-juniper, if you will. I think the time we spent together in here really helped us, or me at least, wind down and deal with being out here for so long. I don't think I want to talk about this. Not now. Maybe never. Oh, Vermilion. I miss that old man. He just had this, like, warmth, you know? I could tell him about anything, and he would just summon wisdom like it was nothing. He was from Earth as well, which, I don't know, it's just nice. I've never been there. He actually left Earth for the first time to come on this mission. That's what all the photos are of, his life on Earth. I know Pistachio was particularly interested in a photo album of his house. She used to sit and flick through it in her downtime. <gasps> he used to live on the coast next to an ocean. Can you believe that? Pistachio's flower, it's in bloom. I can't believe it. She missed it by a few weeks. I just... 
I'm gonna need a few minutes. Look at all this stuff. This is basically the interstellar equivalent of living out of your suitcase. Say, did you know that Philcor sent us away with Equinox brand tea? I didn't even know that people actively chose to buy that stuff, let alone buy the crate. Look, I don't want to sound like a snob and say that brand names are always better, but when it comes to tea, they obviously are, right? The amount of coffee consumed here is unfathomable. It was here that Canary would lead our morning briefings following the mandatory workout session. You know, it's interesting, all this technology, and we've never really improved on an honest cup of coffee. Sure, we have plenty of ways to make you feel less tired, which are far more effective than coffee. Yet, here we are, still drinking the stuff. I think it's in the ritual of it all. There's comfort in it. Let me tell you, whenever I had a coffee in my hand, there wasn't a thing Canary could say to irritate me. She knew it too. Clever, really. This thing is where the ship's fuel is stored before it's piped into the reactor next door. It's lightweight and super efficient or so I'm told. My job is to fly this ship, not top it up. Personally though, I think it looks a little bit like a sad bear. See what I mean? Those raised bits sticking out of the sides sort of look like eyebrows. And the bit at the front is like his, no? Not seeing it? Hmm, all right then. You found it. The Alabaster's best kept secret. The most exclusive bar this side of the firmament. You're now one of only three people that know of its existence. Introducing Space Drink, made by our very own Mr. Marmalade. Light and fruity, inspired by both the condiment that is his namesake and unwanted food from around the alabaster. This is the best way to get a little morning buzz without eating into those all-valuable Philcor reward credits. Try one if you'd like, but save at least a couple for me. me that put the request in for these old machines. They take me back to being a teenager. I get so wrapped up in the nostalgia of it all. I used to bike down to the arcade after school most days. There was this one kid who went by Red. She held the high score on practically every machine in there. Greedy, I know. I set out to beat her at my favorites. Spent a lot of time in pocket change trying to. Never managed it though. For some reason it really stuck with me. I figured that with all the spare time I would have out here, I could take another shot at getting those scores, get some closure on that front. Well, it took a few weeks, but I finally came out on top. It felt amazing. Then Aubergine walked in the next day and bumped me back to second, which did not. Ah, so you've discovered our source of gravity. Nifty, huh? It's fairly common to see big ships like ours create artificial gravity by spinning, but not us. No, we have fancy gravity. It just sits there doing its thing and then everything goes nicely downwards, as it should. Of course, the one main drawback to a system like this is that while it's pretty hard to stop a ship from spinning, it's remarkably easy to hit a button labeled off. I was on a delivery job before joining Philcor where someone, not me, turned off the gravity one morning as a sort of shipwide prank. It was chaos. Stuff everywhere. The hold was a mess. It caused a lot more damage than I, uh, they, intended. So don't touch anything. I too was taken aback by the air in here. Never felt air that was, well, wet before. Breathing feels different. Right now it probably feels a little uncomfortable, maybe a, a bit much. But once you leave the greenhouse, you'll quickly realize that all other air has been selling you short your whole life. As if it's missing key ingredients, like a cake without icing. In the same way that a delicious icing-clad cake spoils all future uniced cakes, the air in here, it ruins the air in the rest of the ship. You see, the thing with cake is that once you have the first special one with that moist, fluffy sponge, a gooey, fruity jam center, and then the icing, Soft and crunchy, decorative yet delicious. I, uh, but where was I again? I lost myself for a moment there. 
Look, I understand the importance of keeping fit. I do, really. But Vermilion's mandatory daily workouts were a burden on my soul. We had to wear these wristbands that would track how far we'd run on any given day and relay our progress back to Vermilion. Naturally, I endeavored to find a shortcut. Initially, I just tried to cram all of my week's quota into a single day, leaving me with six days off. Genius, right? I just about managed it. But Vermilion told me that not only was that borderline dangerous, it was just not how this works. Anyway, I eventually found a use for those cats I was telling you about. Turns out they get around quite a bit, so I just attached my wristband to the most excitable one and forgot about it for a while. It took Vermilion longer than I'm comfortable admitting to work out what I'd done. I've never been much into food. Eating was just something I did out of necessity. That was until Vermilion started cooking for us. He cooked this one thing, he called it a roast. It was meat, chicken, if I remember correctly, and some vegetables. It was all cooked together in an oven, and to top off this madness, we then covered it all in a delicious brown liquid. Apparently it's a big thing in some places on Earth. And my god, I see why. The thing about working in space, and you probably get this too, is that with time, space gets kind of boring. The wonder fades. Everyone I've worked with has said the same, except Marmalade. He would sit by the window over there for hours, looking through the telescopes and drawing any new constellations he saw. He had a sketchbook full of them. They're quite amazing. The telescopes were canaries. She would get a bit wound up when Marmalade tweaked the settings for his own purposes. Although I think even she enjoyed looking through his drawings. Maybe she was even a little proud that they were a product of her telescopes. Ah, the war room. Or at least that's what we called it after our first games night. Oh, I knew it was a bad idea bringing Smash Muddle Scrub on board. I just couldn't help myself. When we arrived and I got to know the others, I just knew it would be something to behold. The first games night resulted in a shipwide silence for two days, email communication only. We agreed to ban the game after that. Despite this, Every time games night would come around, we'd start playing something different, like Indigestion or Please No Not The Melon, and then always end up going back to Smash Metal Scrub. You know, Pluto, I think I've spent enough time in this room to last me a lifetime. I was betrayed by my own appendix, of all things. I mean, the two of us never had a particularly notable relationship, but we coexisted happily. So I thought. I was bedbound for over a week, with nothing to do except suffer through Vermilion's ancient music taste. I suppose I shouldn't be too hard on the old guy, though. He did save my life. Hey, you found my hideaway. Cozy, huh? Me and Pistachio would grab some blankets and sit up here to watch films after work. I brought my whole collection of tapes on board with me. I swear we watched Crow Division like a thousand times. The second one, though. Everyone knows the first one is trash. Sometimes if we were too lazy to get up and change the tape, we'd just sit and watch the terminal logo bounce around the screen. Pistachio claimed that one time she saw it hit the corner, and I'm pretty sure she was lying. Right. I need you to bear with me for a second, because I've got a vent here. When we were all selected for this mission, we could submit requests for things we wanted to have on board these requests would be evaluated on costs and necessity and whatnot. Now, the Filament Corporation were pretty accommodating on the matter, but there was one thing I requested that got denied. I wanted a dance floor. You know, one of the ones with all the colored tiles and flashing lights? Now, I know a little unreasonable, it was a long shot, but think about the morale benefits. Unsurprisingly, my request was denied. Whenever I was fine with it but then I get on board and find that they've given Canary an entire pool. Now I know what you're thinking, isn't a pool just a hole in the ground? Well, you're right, it is just a hole in the ground. A hole containing 400 gallons of water? Do you know how heavy that is? Heavier than a dance floor? And you can't spill a dance floor! Ah, you found Aubergine's cave. If he wasn't hidden away in his room, you could be sure to find him here. I don't know how he possibly sat in such a warm, dimly lit room all day and ever got anything done. Sounds like optimal napping conditions to me. 
That said, it's probably hard to sleep with Canary constantly looming over you. She was always on his back about how messy this place was. Something about health and safety. I think it may have been the exposed wiring and piles of debris. Personally, I think it has a certain charm to it. Kind of organized chaos. I can respect that. You know, I've been aboard a few ships with pretty dire issues in the shower department. The Alabaster is not one of them. We've got it all. Good water pressure, dials that actually perform as advertised, and a seemingly endless supply of hot water. I'm sure you can appreciate that as a traveler yourself. I mean, your ship is pretty compact. I bet your shower is tiny. You, uh, you have a shower, right? I'm going to choose to believe that you do. You may have noticed a few of these spacesuits are missing a limb or two. Philcor were nice enough to provide us with personalized suits that are cut off around our augmentations. It's so we can make better use of them outside of the ship. Pretty cool, huh? Aubergine wasn't pleased about how much his resembled a one-piece swimsuit. It's a look, for sure, but I think he rocked it. It's a little bit terrifying, isn't it? Hard to believe that putting yourself through this thing could actually fix you. It was this large metal cylinder that had the honor of separating me from my appendix. I asked Vermillion if I could keep it after the surgery, like in a jar or something, but he just sighed and didn't answer me. Classic Vermillion. I think that in the end, this room was gutted for spare parts to help construct the anchors, so it won't be up and running again anytime soon. On a completely unrelated note, how are you feeling? Well? You're feeling well, right? Good. How anyone finds anything in this place is beyond me. The boxes are barely distinguishable. This is where stuff from the cargo bay lives after it's unpacked. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff I've found on these shelves. Sometimes I would come in here and pop a box open just for the excitement of seeing what's in it. Obviously, I found plenty of boxes filled with staples or sticky notes, but occasionally I would stumble on something great. I did, however, once open a box that seemed damaged. It was some plant of pistachios, and get this, it had teeth. It was trying to get out. She assured me it wouldn't have gotten anywhere, but I'm still glad I stumbled across it when I did. This is where we built the anchors. I say we. Marmalade and Aubergine handled that. One of the few advantages of being so far from civilization is that we're pretty equipped to manufacture spare parts for when stuff breaks. Within reason, of course. I'm told building the anchors was pretty straightforward. It was the machine in the back corner that used to crank them out. The pro we began working on after the failure of the first. I suggested we call it the Lantern 3, but Canary, you know. We never did finish it though. It was around the time that everything went south. It's too bad it never launched. It had some pretty nifty features. I still don't understand what happened to the first one, but I feel somewhat responsible seeing as I was the pilot, and the failure was its lack of landing. Still, it behaved so weirdly. I don't feel like there was anything I could have done to land that 